RC Jim and welcome to another one of our helpful videos. Now this one I want to uh, discuss all about electric radio controlled aircraft. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty tall order. There's a lot to cover. We'll see how much we can get into this initial video and then we may follow up with some other ones depending on how we go. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, all about electric uh, radio controlled aircraft. Uh, many of us are extremely familiar with the good old nitro motors and uh, things that we used to use back in the good old days and a lot of people still use these and there's an argument for them and in another video we'll uh, compare the two but nowadays what's really popular are the good old electric uh, brushless motors uh, and uh, make things quite simple so in this video I want to tell you everything that um, that uh, I think you need to know uh, with regard to uh, electric uh, radio controlled aircraft. So, uh, beginning with the very basics, we ask ourselves, well, what makes a motor go? And for that, we go back to good old electromagnetics. Um, you probably studied this in school, uh, but uh, say you took a nail and you wrapped a, a wire around it, one with um, uh, insulation on it so it doesn't short out with the nail. And let's say you apply a current to it so you got a, a negative and a positive that you put on there and the current is flowing through that wire and that creates what we call magnetic flux. In the magnetic flux it's magnetism that is flowing around you know through the air and through the, uh, the nail. Uh, and with that magnetic flux uh, it creates a north and a south pole of a magnet. Okay, now we would also be familiar with the fact that if you had, say, a permanent magnet up here that had a, a north and a south pole on it, that trying to push the north against the north is going to try and push it away. Uh, but on the other hand, if we had one down here that had north on this end and a south on the bottom end, the north and the south are going to attract each other. So, when you think about an electric motor, it's basically utilizing those principles. Uh, and uh, you got magnets that are either pulling or pushing on each other, and actually doing both at the same time at different places within the motor. So, now let's just uh, think a bit about the actual motor itself and how it's configured. Now, as you think about your typical little brushless motor, You've got part of the motor that is fixed and part of it rotates. This one's an outrunner, so the outside is going around, and the inside with the windings in it is fixed. And basically it's something like this right here. So you've got this fixed part on the outside, and those are permanent magnets. And on the inside you've got this armature, well, uh, the, the, um, the windings um, that um, uh, that create an electromagnet that's constantly changing depending on what sort of electricity you put into these things. And it operates on a three-phase situation, so not just two wires but two. So it's going to power A and B and then B and C and then C and A and A and B, B and C, C and A, you know, and it will continue alternating the current in those particular ways. Now the uh, outside magnets are, are permanent and I say outside, this is for an outrunner, and the same principle would apply if it's an inrunner. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. But let's say this is a north magnet uh, here and here, and this is a south magnet there and there. Okay. Now, what's going to be north and south inside is going to vary depending where the power is put. But let's say we initially put power to A and B. So the, the current goes in, it goes around this winding here, connects in the middle, goes around that one there and back out. So it's actually powered two things. But in doing so, it's created, let's say, a north pole here and a south pole there. Okay? Now, north and north wants to push away from each other, but it's all lined up so nothing is going to happen. Okay? South and south want to push away from each other, and south is a little bit beyond the middle of that south, so that's going to be a little bit of a push but it's going to be very much attracted to the north over here. So this one is going to try to move in that direction. As that moves in that direction, the north is getting to where it's actually got some push on it. The center of it is over there. This one's coming over here. 
So it's starting to push, and at the same time, it's getting closer to the south, and so that's going to be attracting that. So you got a push, a pull, a, a push, and a pull all happening around the same time, okay? Then it's going to switch to, to BC, and it's going to power these two. And you're going to have a situation where you got this one pulling, that one pushing, and this one pulling, and so forth. And it's going to continue going around as the current alternates between those, those um, uh, three wires that are going into it. So that's the, the nature of a uh, brushless, synchronous DC motor. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this is a brushless motor, which means that one that has brushes on the center shaft, you would have little uh, contact surfaces around there that a brush would make contact to, to decide which part of the motor gets electric current running to it. Well, these things are running at like 50 amps or something like that. It's an awful lot of current. And brushes in a situation like that, you know, they're going to burn out, they're going to wear, you have all kinds of problems. But if you have this part of the motor, the part that has the windings on it, if that's fixed and it doesn't rotate to where all of these wires just simply are wires going to it and they just simply dodge the, the rotating parts, um, then you can have the permanent magnet part be the part that spins around and that doesn't need to have any wires connected to it. So you got a brushless motor. Now it's synchronous because you got this three phase thing. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the controller will first off send power to say AB. Then <laughs> a fraction of a millisecond later, it sends power to BC. And a fraction of a millisecond later, it sends it to CA. And then a fraction of a millisecond later, it sends it to AB. And so it goes on down the line and that, that uh, rotating sort of situation with that alternating current going around there, uh, it uh, causes us to move. Okay, now what makes all of this happen? Well, basically it comes down to this little guy right here. This is called an ESC. It's got three wires coming out. That's for that ABC situation that we've got there. You've got uh, a black and a white, a black and a red, coming in, that's for your normal plus and minus uh, power. And it's got a like a servo cable that comes out of it that uh, plugs into your receiver. And that gives power to the receiver, plus the receiver sends a signal to it to uh, tell it how fast to run. And um, it also uh, has a little bit of a feedback circuit where the motor tells the ESC where its position is at. Okay. Um, so that's the brains of the outfit right there. Now, it's very different from a conventional motor as far as giving the th throttle, okay? With a conventional motor, we give it the throttle, you open up the, the, um, uh, the, the throttle blade on the thing, and it just pumps as much power as it, it can at that level with that amount of fuel and it develops maximum power, and that's what you've got. And depending on how hard it is to spin the propeller, it'll spin a certain RPM, and, and that's that. With the, the electric motor, it's different in that the ESC is sending to the motor a signal that says how fast to go. It has to do with how quick it's changing from A to B to B to C to C to A and so forth, you know, going along there. Uh, uh, and it's the speed that's going to be determined. Now, if the motor is having a hard time keeping up with that speed, that motor will draw more current to try and maintain it. So it's kind of like an artificial intelligence in a sense, that it will draw whatever current it needs, or whatever it can, it'll try to draw as much as it can, uh, to be able to maintain that speed. Uh, and eventually, of course, it'll get to the point where it just can't draw any more, and it'll come to a maximum. Um, but um, but at lower speeds, where it's real easy for it to do it, it just simply won't draw as much current. Okay. So with this electric motor, it's going to be drawing whatever current it can. Now, that's where you come up uh, with some issues. Uh, with this particular motor, it will have a certain maximum current that it's rated for. 
And the idea with that is these windings inside can only handle a certain amount of current before they get so hot that they start to melt and the coating melts off of them and all starts uh, shorting out and either catches on fire or you know quits working, you know whatever the case might be. So it's got a maximum current that it can handle. The ESC also has a maximum current that it can handle. So you see this one is a 65A, so that indicates that it's a, capable to handle uh, 65 amps. It's also got a limit on the voltage that it can handle. So this one says 3S to 6S LiPo. Um, so uh, a 3 cell to a 6 cell battery, and we'll be talking about that uh, in a bit. So this has got limits to it as to uh, how much current it can handle before it melts along the way. But with a battery, uh, as you think about this, if I was to short this lead on the battery, do you think it would have any limit as to what sort of current it would generate? <laughs> well, if I put a wire across, you know, and, and touch the end of that, it would start, you know, as it got close, it would turn into an arc welder. <laughs> and if it hadn't blown up yet by the time I actually touched the thing to it, you know, it's developed maybe hundreds of amps. I, I don't know exactly what it might be, but, you know, it would be a huge amount and most likely a battery would explode, okay? <laughs> and if I was lucky, it might just melt. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, the, the, the um, uh, battery, again, is rated, and like this one is a 50C. Uh, so that's what it's rated at, but the rating isn't what it can generate. The rating is what it can survive. <laughs> so as you think about the, the motor, it's going to draw as much current as it needs to try and maintain the RPM that the ESC is telling it to, um, to run at, and it's going to take whatever current it can out of the battery to maintain that. And so if you put too big of a prop on the thing, it's going to try and run that thing at the same speed as it would try to be doing a little prop, and you can have disastrous results. So the motor can melt, the ESC can melt, the battery can melt or explode, <laughs> all kinds of issues like that. So that's very different than the, the nitro motor, where if you put too big of a prop on it, it just simply slows down and doesn't run very well, okay? But it doesn't blow up on you. <laughs> So those are things to keep in mind with regard to electric aircraft. As you think about a, a motor like this, you don't have to worry about the, um, uh, there's no brushes in it to wear out or that type of thing. It does have bearings and the bearings can go bad. Uh, and it also, uh, since it's got permanent magnets in it, those permanent magnets, if the thing got real hot or so forth, they might deteriorate and, and lose you know, their magnetism. Um, so it ought to be periodically checked. So every time you use it, you ought to give it a bit of a wiggle, just see if there's any movement with regard to the bearings. And then occasionally, you know, it might be once a year or something, but um, occasionally you probably want to do a power test on it, where you actually run it up and see how much uh, uh, thrust it generates and um, uh, uh, compare that with previous uh, uh, results and make sure it's still developing the sort of power that you want it to, to develop. And, and if you don't have this set up for measuring the thrust, uh, a simple thing to do is just measure the RPM. Uh, you know, if it's got the uh, big prop on it, the, the prop that it normally would use, um, then you uh, should be able to um, use a little uh, RPM measuring device. It's optical. You just point it at the prop tells you how fast it's going and if it's not able to maintain the proper RPM with a proper prop on it then that's telling you that the motor is uh, deteriorating. Okay now there's two varieties of uh, electric motors. You've got the outrunner such as what this one is and you've got an inrunner. The windings are always going to be fixed but some, of, some motors will have them on the outside and some of them have on the inside. So one like this with the permanent magnets on the outside, that's an outrunner. Uh, the uh, advantage of the outrunner is that since you need a certain amount of space to get those windings in there, you tend to have a larger diameter case in order to fit those windings in there. 
and having a larger diameter case means you can fit more magnets around the outside. Now keep in mind with our diagram here, this is kind of like the minimum sort of situation, having the, the three um, uh, divisions to the, uh, the part with the windings. But you can multiply that 3 by whatever you want. So that could be 6, it could be 9, it could be 12, you know, whatever the size of the motor is going to allow. It'll always be a multiple of 3. On the outside, again, it can have as many as are going to fit and are going to be suitable for what you've got on the inside, and that will always be a multiple of 2. You certainly don't want a situation where you say you had three on the inside and three on the outside. They could all just line up and the motor is just going to freeze there. <laughs> so by having this difference between the uh, multiples of two and the multiples of three, you have a situation where something is always out of line and it's going to be pulling the motor to turn it, to straighten it out, and as it does that, it's going to get going and, and uh, off it goes. Um, so anyway, uh, we've got the, those windings on the inside. The, the wires go behind this rotating part. Um, the solar part here is fixed. The black part is the part that is, is rotating. Um, and so the, the wires are fixed onto those windings. Um, and um, uh, then the case is actually turning the part that the prop is attached to. It also turns a shaft on the back on this particular one. Um, it might be you've got a ducted fan or you've got a, a boat or a car or something else that, that needs that kind of shaft and so it's given that sort of option. For the airplane it's not really doing anything. Um, but um, I suppose you'd run a fan on it if you had a heat problem. <laughs> but anyway, um, so that's the outrunner. Okay, the inrunner has the windings on the outside and the permanent magnets on the inside. Uh, they tend to have a smaller diameter case and with them you've got the advantage that with the windings on the outside they're connected to this case and so the case becomes like a, a heat sink sort of thing where the air going past the case is actually going to cool it whereas on the outrunner the air has actually got to go through to the inside there and exit out the back in order to, um, to be able to cool the motor. So that's an advantage of the inrunner. Uh, but with the outrunner, with a larger diameter, it tends to produce more torque. And uh, consequently, you know, this little motor here will turn a prop that big as compared to the black prop is for the uh, roughly equivalent size nitro motor and the gray prop is for the electric one. Uh, and it will vary a little bit depending on what speed motor that you get. These do come in different speeds. Um, but anyway, uh, this little motor will turn a great big prop uh, and partly because it's a outrunner that uh, tends to um, uh, generate a lot of torque. Okay, uh, the inrunner will tend to run higher RPMs and um, that's largely due to um, the, the fact that it's got a smaller number of magnets uh, on it, on the outside. And as you think about those signals going to the windings on the inside, it, just like a computer, it can handle, you know, a certain speed, you know, a computer being megahertz or whatever it might be, but it can handle a certain amount of speed of things. And the ESC is kind of like a little computer. It's sending out these signals and it can send them at a certain amount of speed in a forever revolution, it's got to do more signals for one like this. That's going to tend to limit the speed that it can go. So the um, uh, inrunner will tend to go faster. It tends to have a smaller diameter case, so it can be good for ducted fan um, models and, and things such as that. And it's good for cooling. But the outrunner is good for swinging a big prop. And as you think about scale-like function, if you've got an airplane that has a prop on it, one thing that um, you note in terms of model aircraft is it seems much more scale-like if the RPM is closer to the real thing. So if the, if the, uh, the prop is whizzing away at 25,000 RPM, <laughs> that's nothing like what a real airplane would be. The real airplane way, way slower than that. And so instead of uh, hearing a brrrm, you know, you hear a you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, 
So uh, having the, I, I like the idea of uh, swinging a slower prop, similar to using a four-stroke as compared to a two-stroke on the uh, nitro engines. Um, okay, so I, we talked about the cooling, we talked about the torque, um, the size, um, those are the basic things. Now, as you think about the things you'll need, we'll, we'll talk more about the uh, nitro engine in another video. But as far as the electric setup, you're going to have a motor, you're going to have an ESC, and you're going to have a battery. Uh, battery is going to put power uh, to the ESC. So the, the red and the black will connect to the red and the black to um, give it power. The ESC is going to uh, connect up to the, the motor. And it actually doesn't make any difference at all what wire connects to what wire there. It's just that after you get it connected up and you see what direction it goes, if it's going backwards, then you'll need to swap two of the wires and then it'll reverse it. Um, and I could tell you why, but just simply it does that. Okay, um, the ESC is going to plug into your receiver and that's going to give the receiver power. Okay, uh, so that's basically what you need to, to make it work. Now let's think a little bit more about this uh, ESC and uh, what's going on uh, with it. Uh, ESC, by the way, is uh, Electronic Speed Control, ESC. That's what it stands for. And it, it has some cool things that are happening into it. Um, first off, as you uh, think about the, um, uh, the deal, it's got that uh, BEC, Battery Eliminator Circuit that is included in it. And what that enables you to do is if you had a nitro plane, you'd still need a little battery in it to power the receiver. And so with the ESC, you don't need that separate battery. You could have a separate one, but you don't have to have a separate one because it's plugged into the normal battery and the ESC is going to reduce the voltage to get it down to what your transmitter needs or uh, your receiver needs uh, and provide that uh, current to it. So it's going to be doing that. Um, uh, it's, this ESC is going to have a fail-safe mode in it. So let's say your battery gets uh, low on voltage and it gets down to, you know, whatever the, the minimum might be, 3.4 volts or whatever it is uh, per cell. Um, and uh, it's getting down close to that, and the danger is that if this thing goes totally flat, then nothing works, and not only your motor quits, but you don't have any control of your airplane. So the ESC has got a, a fail-safe circuit in there to where if the voltage is getting low on your battery, it will cut power to the motor, but it will maintain power to the receiver. And that hopefully will allow you to be able to glide in and do a dead stick landing and uh, not have a great big drama as far as that situation is concerned. Have a situation much like the fuel running out of your uh, nitro plane uh, where you run out of fuel, the motor is quit, but you glide in and you land it. Um, so the ESC will do that uh, for you. Um, the uh, ESC uh, can also have the capability of braking the motor. That is to say that when the motor stops, if it's just in its normal set of mode, it's quite easy for it to spin, and the propeller will keep on spinning around just from the air blowing onto it. Uh, but there are a couple of situations where you would prefer for that not to happen. Uh, for one thing, uh, spinning the blade like that is going to create more drag than if the blade is just sitting out there stationary. So if the blade is sitting out there stationary, it's not going to slow down the plane as much as if it's making the um, propeller spin. Um, secondly, you might have, say, a glider that has a folding prop, and when, the, when you turn off the motor, you want the prop to stop and let the uh, wind blowing by fold it in next to the fuselage. So something like that, you'd like to have a brake on it. Um, uh, so, um, uh, it can do that, but to do that, it won't be set up to do that initially. What you have to do is you have to use a programming card with it to uh, alter the characteristics, and there'll be a number of things that you can alter uh, as far as how it's programmed, but one of those is to turn on the, the braking mode. 
Now with these uh, uh, programmers, uh, little, little guys like this, uh, each manufacturer will tend to have at least one and maybe more than one depending on what sort of motors they have. And uh, typically they'll say that their programming card is only good for, uh, for their particular uh, 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 ESC. Um, and I'm not real sure how much you can get away with with <laughs> going crisscross, you know, using a, you know, a Cobra thing to try and uh, work with a uh, uh, different uh, manufacturer. Um, some of them are ones like, like this that you can hook up to your computer and do some stuff with a computer. Other ones, they just simply will have a little toggle thing where you cycle down on a little list of items to the particular item that you want to change and then you'll press another button to toggle it between the different choices that you've got. So break on, break off sort of thing. Uh, just very simple. Uh, so uh, you can get those, but like I say, they tend to be a different uh, programming card for each brand or each type of, um, of uh, EFC. Okay, uh, they do have the capability of providing a low voltage alarm, uh, which can be helpful. Um, you can select the motor direction, so if it's spinning in the wrong way, instead of swapping two of the uh, wires, you could use the programming card to reverse the motor. Uh, and they have a soft start mode, and where the soft, soft start mode is uh, important is you can imagine with one of these uh, electric motors, they generate an awful lot of torque very quickly. And if you've got a whole bunch of gears and, and stuff that has to get going, <laughs> this thing could rip them apart <laughs> if it just immediately provides all of the power all at once. So with a helicopter, it basically wants a soft start where it gradually gets the thing spinning up, swooling up, and, um, and, and then off you go. Whereas with a motor, it's not so important. And talking about the quick soft starts and stops, uh, one of the potential issues with the, uh, the brake on the motor is that it won't just sort of instantly, you know, in a, a millisecond, you know, stop the thing. But it does stop it pretty quick, and it uses a fair bit of reverse torque to, to do that. And um, you potentially could have a situation where it actually loosens the prop <laughs> when you hit the brake. Uh, so, uh, if you're using the brake, you want to make sure that you have the prop on uh, nice and tight. One very important thing uh, with the, uh, the, the motor and the ESC is to make sure that your transmitter um, is doing the right thing with regard to the throttle position uh, and what the motor does. So you might find even with a, a plane that you get that's already set up, like that Corsair or the Mustang or the Ranger up there, uh, that you end up pushing the strict stick up a fair ways before the motor starts. And it may not be at full throttle when actually the stick is all the way up there. So that's a matter of calibration of the ESC. And we'll do another video on that, but essentially what's involved is um, uh, you bind your transmitter to the plane, uh, you um, unplug the plane, you um, uh, then take your transmitter, put the throttle, well, <laughs> before you do that, you take the prop off the plane, because this can be a dangerous sort of thing if the wrong thing happens. You have the prop removed off the plane. Uh, so anyway, you have your throttle all the way up and uh, have any throttle cut you know, turned off, so you got full throttle uh, on the thing. And that's with a transmitter uh, running. And then you plug in the plane, being very careful, like with the prop off and so forth. And that uh, tells the ESC what maximum throttle is. Uh, you give it a few seconds, and then you take it down to zero throttle, and then you unplug your plane. And from there on, you should have proper control. But uh, we'll show you more details on that in another video. Uh, and it is something you want to be very careful with, you know, anytime you go starting your, uh, uh, plugging in your plane with full throttle on your transmitter, you know, that, that's sort of a, you know, what's going to happen here. Well, let's now have a little bit more of an in-depth look at these batteries. Now, these are pretty fabulous set of things. 
As you can see from this, it's a, a LiPo battery, so that refers to it being lithium polymer. And the lithium polymer uh, batteries are what really revolutionized the uh, radio-controlled flying and allowing us to use these in planes. Uh, something that NICADs and other sorts of uh, batteries couldn't do, these guys really have delivered. I mean, imagine this little thing right here. 50C at uh, 3,300 milliamp hours, you're talking about 50 times 3.3, that's 165 amps that this can deliver. At around about 15 to 16 volts, I mean, that is something that's huge. Um, so these things uh, really do a great job. Now, as you think about the, the voltage of the battery, it does vary. So it's going to start out at uh, around about 4.2 volts per cell. This one has four cells and it's wired in series, so those all get added together. Um, uh, and of course, you can have them with different number of cells from one to six or more, uh, depending on the, uh, the plane. But, uh, but yeah, uh, it starts out at 4.2 volts per cell and when it's fully discharged, it'll be down around about 3.4 volts uh, per cell. Uh, and uh, that allows you to be able to determine how far discharged it is uh, when you're uh, checking it. And uh, of course your ESC is able to work out what's needed as far as what goes to the motor and what goes to the uh, receiver and all of that. So uh, what are some things that we need to know about this? Well, first off, you know this strange situation where you have not only a plus and a minus coming out of the battery, but you've also got this other little connector, and we call that a balance lead. Um, and this balance circuit has got a number of different functions, but the, the biggest thing is to be able to use a balance charger. And the balance charger is going to have both of these plugged into it, and the charger is going to make sure that each individual cell of the battery is properly charged. Now without that, just simply sending uh, power to all of them, you could end up having a situation where one cell is overcharged and another cell is undercharged and it could lead to dangerous situations. So the balance circuit uh, helps you to avoid that by um, the charger uh, knowing uh, which cells need to have the power and to seek to charge them equally. But the other thing it does is it enables you to be able to check to see the condition of your battery. So um, you can get a, a little um, uh, battery capacity meter, such as this one here. Uh, this one is the um, G, GT, is it? Um, yeah, GT power uh, version of the, um, the thing. And um, essentially what you do with this is you uh, plug the, uh, the balance lead into the charger and yeah, the charger into the checker. And with any of these, they're going to have one end that you work from. It might be numbered from 0 to 10 or whatever it might be. Um, on this one, it just simply talks about one being down at this end, and it's got sort of a line saying something bigger at that end. But the bottom line is where I've got that odd-colored wire, the red one, uh, that's going to go away from the starting position and it's also got a little bump on it that uh, sort of makes sure that it plugs into the right place. Now with this uh, plugged in, it then gives you a reading to say what the condition of the battery is. So we got the 15.35 volts, that's the overall voltage for all four cells. It says that it's 45 percent, as you can see there. And I can also press the button and have a look at each individual cell and see what they're doing. And so pressing this button in the, in the middle, I can see what's going on there. Um, so uh, very, very helpful. Uh, you'll note that we had to select lithium polymer as a battery type for it to work properly. But um, that balance lead allows you to be able to check on uh, things such as that. Um, Okay, uh, now with a, a, a battery like this, um, you've got your charge level, but uh, obviously you want it fully charged when you're getting ready to go flying, but the question is what do you do after flying? And they actually recommend with these that you store them partially charged. 
Now, ideally, if you're talking about very long-term storage, that's going to be something around 50%, and you can read the uh, instructions that come with the battery, and it'll tell you something like that. Um, but uh, what we do, uh, you know, flying week to week, you know, maybe it doesn't even make any difference, I'm not sure. But what our practice is at our club, for, for most of us, is that we will fly targeting having 30% left in the battery at the end of the flight. Uh, 30% is a good level as far as it being able to uh, have a decent shelf life and, you know, continue on. And 30% uh, also gives us a bit of a safety margin. So, you know, you don't want to be flying and plan on uh, expending all of your battery and then realize that, oh, I used a bit more throttle and I, I was expected to actually drew more power than what I had planned on and the thing goes flat. Uh, so uh, we plan on leaving 30%, and sometimes it might be 25, sometimes it might be 50, um, and from week to week that's not going to be a particular issue, but that kind of kills two birds with one stone. One thing you will find is that if you didn't use the battery and you want to discharge it, I don't know about all of the chargers and how they work, but a, a Spectrum S1200, such as what I have, if you try to use that to discharge a battery to go to the storage level, that thing takes forever. <laughs> so what I do with mine, if I need to discharge them, I just put them in the plane and tie the plane down on the bench and run the engine for a period of time uh, to get it down where I want it to be. Okay, um, I might just mention that with regard to, to storage, um, uh, naturally with your transmitter, or not storage, just how long to run the battery when you're flying, uh, your transmitter will have a timer on it, and you'll be setting that for the time that you sort of expect that the battery is going to uh, allow you to fly to get to that 30%. Uh, but it's just simply based on however many minutes you are above you know, a particular throttle level, 30% or something like that. So it's far from being accurate. Uh, some receivers and transmitters will also have a, a telemetry function where they the uh, radio in the plane will tell your transmitter what the voltage is on the receiver battery. Um, and with something like that, you can set up an alarm to, to warn you, and that would be much more reliable than just simply using a timer. Okay, with the uh, battery, uh, this particular one, you see it uh, listed as being 14.8 volts. But as you look at another one here, you can see it not only tells you the 14.8 volts, but it also tells you that it's a 4S. Now the 4S and the 14.8 volts just simply tell you how many cells it's got. And so as you look at this particular battery, you can see it's got four segments. Each one of those layers is a cell that's in there. So it's not like the round ones. These are flat plates sort of thing. Um, and so 4S just simply means four cells, and at a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts per cell, four of them makes 14.8 volts, five of them 18.5, six of them 22.2, and so forth. So that voltage is just simply an indication of how many cells are in your battery. Um, as you uh, think about what this means for your airplane, you take something like my um, P-51 Mustang uh, up there behind the Corsair. Um, something like that, you can fly it on either a three-cell battery or a four-cell battery. Well, what difference is it going to make? What sort of difference in the punch and all of that type of thing? Well, varying that voltage is going to vary the RPM of the motor. All of these electric motors will have a KV rating, and that KV rating is uh, how many RPMs it will turn per volt of electricity that's sent to it. Okay, so the ESC is going to be sending uh, you know, a certain amount of uh, electricity to it to get the RPM that uh, is indicated by, by what it wants. Um, and uh, so as you think about the, those volts, if a 3S has got 50% more than a 2S, and you know, a 4S has got 33% uh, uh, more than a, um, uh, than a 3S, then what that's saying is that the RPM is going to change by that amount. 
and changing the RPM by that amount is going to make a huge difference on the amount of thrust that that particular propeller and motor uh, generates. And so it's going to make a huge difference when you jump up from one number of cells to the next number up, you know. Um, so as you think about a particular plane, it will make a lot of difference in terms of performance as to which option you, uh, you choose. And of course, with any of them, you don't have to run at full throttle. So, you know, uh, I suppose if you've got a brand new sports car with a huge motor in it, you know, you're not going to be running that at full power, even though it can. Uh, so your plane, you got the same thing. So, you know, my advice is basically go for the higher end and then just use it as it's needed along the way. Okay, uh, we've already mentioned about the C rating, and so we'll just mention that again uh, for the sake of, uh, of uh, making sure that we understand. You've got the 50C, sorry, 50C over here that uh, is the C rating of the battery, and that's an indication of how many amps it can handle, but it's not the actual number of amps. You take the 50 times the amp hour capacity of the battery. So uh, 3,300 milliamp hours is 3.3 amp hours. So you take the 3.3 times the 50, and that will give you, what, 165 amps is the capacity of this battery. Now that's also telling you what amps to charge it at. At one C level is what you are going to use for charging. So one C is just multiplying one times this, so 3.3 times one is saying you could charge this at 3.3 amps. Now as you think about that, if it's got 3.3 amp hours is the capacity of the battery. What the, the thing is able to generate is 3.3 amps over one hour. Now you're going to be drawing a lot faster than that, but you know that's the capacity is 3.3 amps for one hour. So if you put 3.3 amps into it, well you can expect it's going to take a little over an hour uh, to fully charge the battery if it was starting from zip, you know, from nothing. Now, you'll always be starting from some value, uh, so it'll be less than that. Um, but nonetheless, in my thinking, what they've done is they just said, yeah, an hour is a reasonable time for charging a battery, uh, and we'll just go with that. <laughs> uh, but certainly that's a safe level as far as charging is concerned. Okay, now, um, with this... Uh, 3,300 milliamp hour, I mentioned that's the capacity, and I said, yeah, you could run it at 3.3 amps for an hour, but nobody's going to fly for an hour at length. <laughs> you get some very sore thumbs, um, and you're going to need a whole lot more than 3.3 amps. But the question is, what sort of size battery do you need, do you need for a particular flight? Well, let's just take an example. Uh, let's say that we want to fly for six minutes. Okay, and you probably want a little bit more than that, but I want the maths to be real easy. Okay, So, six minutes, if we convert that into an hour, we divide that by 60 minutes per hour. And that is to say that six minutes is one-tenth of an hour. Okay, and that makes sense? Okay. So you got 60, um, uh, six minutes uh, divided by 60. Okay, um, then we have to decide how many amps we're going to be drawing. And so you have to have a look at your motor's capacity, but you might figure around half of the, uh, the maximum capacity of the motor for um, continuous uh, use. You know, if the, this is talking about sport flying. If you're racing or doing aerobatics or something else, you're going to use a lot more. But uh, let's say we got a, a 50 amp motor and so we think, okay, we're going to take an educated guess and we're going to say that we run it, uh, at, we average 25 amps that we're drawing uh, out of that. Okay, so we've now, no longer the minutes, we've now got hours and we got amps, so we've got amp hours, but we want milliamp hours, so we've got to multiply it by a thousand to get our milliamp hours, so a thousand milliamps per amp. And when you uh, multiply and divide, you come up with 2,500 milliamp hours. Okay, so if that was what you're after, then that's the sort of capacity of the battery that you need. 
We'd note that six minutes is probably a little bit on the light side, so we probably want to go a little bit above that. So rather than go with, say, a 2200 milliamp hour battery, uh, let's go with, say, a 3200 milliamp hour battery. And if we have the 3200, well, that's going to increase the, the six minutes accordingly. So that'll give you a rough idea. Naturally, as you, uh, when you buy a plane that's already got a battery or um, uh, motor and, and stuff in it or recommendations made, chances are in the instructions they'll give you an idea of what time to shoot for. Naturally, you'll, you'll target something lower uh, to begin with and then check it with your, your meter after each flight, see where you're at, and then you can make adjustments accordingly along the way. Uh, and just thinking about that difference in terms of what you're drawing, keep in mind here that if we drew 50 amps on the average, then in order to come up with the same number down here, we've got to cut this in half. If we double that, we've got to cut that one in half. So at 50 amps, it's only going to last for three minutes. So it's going to make a huge difference. You know, you talk about the same plane, we're just talking about pedal to metal versus 50% cruising. Um, yeah, it can make a huge difference along the way. Now let's talk a bit about propellers. Uh, with something like the nitro motor, it's going to run on a propeller such as this one right here. That's a, um, a 46, a 0.46 cubic inch, develops, you know, 1.4 horsepower, something like that. Um, and uh, this is a uh, propeller, you know, one of the ones that I've used with it. And, and um, this one is a, an 11 by 6 uh, that would be quite suitable for that particular motor. With this little guy here, it'll actually swing this 15 by 8 prop. Now, with the electric motors, you can stick an ordinary prop on it, but it may not give you the best performance. And when you look at the charts, the uh, uh, various motors you can, on the internet, you'll find uh, uh, charts that uh, uh, will tell you about the performance. And uh, I've got another video in the works that will be talking about the fine details of uh, prop selection and all that type of thing. But essentially, the thought is, is that <laughs> these little guys can swing a great big prop. Um, uh, but you can have some issues if you got a plane that is built for this one, and like this, this is part of a conversion that I'm doing right now, converting from that 46 to that particular motor right there. But the question is, am I going to fit that prop <laughs> onto that plane? You know, I think probably not. Uh, so I have a choice. I can either go to um, either a three or four bladed prop to be able to try and deliver the amount of power that it can do. Um, or I can just simply choose to not be so efficient and just pick a, a smaller uh, length of prop that will fit on the thing. And going to smaller is safe in that it's going to be easier for it to spin. It's going to draw less amps. But the issue will be, am I going to generate the amount of thrust that I want to? So that'll take a little bit of testing. And again, <laughs> I've got another video that I'm going to be doing on that where... Um, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that I'm not going to go out and spend thousands of dollars on test equipment and things like that when I can jury rig up something here in the garage that, with stuff that I've got around. And um, so uh, in testing these props, I'll be using my little uh, mini tack to determine the RPM. I'll be using a fish scale to measure the thrust. <laughs> and uh, I'll be putting on oh, and then I've got a... Uh, a watt meter where I can measure the current and how many watts is being generated and uh, I can try different props and make sure that I've got something that's going to fit in the parameters. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, that's a little bit down the track so what you need to do is just subscribe to my channel and uh, all these crazy things that I'm doing and ideas that I'm coming up with and putting everything on video you know so uh, you'll eventually get it. Uh, just a question of uh, how long it takes me to get through all of these wonderful ideas uh, that I've got that I want to share. Okay, uh, oh, I, I, with the props, um, some of the props have got an E designation on them, okay? And so the E designation says that they're designed for electric, and uh, this one says not for gas engines, you know? <laughs> 
Um, I don't know if they're talking about petrol, if they're talking about glow fuel, but uh, anyway, the thought is that these are, are built lighter and they're designed specifically for electric motors. Um, so it'll be slightly different in its characteristics, and you can see the very thin tip that, uh, that this one has as compared to, say, you know, this uh, particular one here. Uh, you can see the tip, you know, very, very different as far as the uh, shape and the configuration. So the, the main thing to realize there is when you're looking up um, test data on the different props and uh, what they're going to do with your particular motor, uh, an EPROP is different from an ordinary prop, and you just need to make sure that you, you're aware of that. Well, that's the basics on electric RC planes. Uh, as I mentioned, I've got a, a number of videos in the works. I'm going to be uh, doing one here, very next one today, I think I'll get into it, is comparing the nitro motors to the electrics and the advantages and disadvantages of each. Uh, I'll be going into more detail on picking uh, uh, appropriate components, you know, uh, selecting the right prop and the right ESC and, and the uh, right motor. Um, uh, but having said that, like say with my Mustang, up there, wherever it is, uh, sort of in the background, I think, behind the Corsair, uh, with that Mustang, uh, it comes with a four-bladed prop, but the material that they use, it, it's an E-Flight, and not to disparage them too much, but um, uh, that prop is not made out of the same sort of material that, say, a Master Air Screw or a, a APC or whatever prop would, would have. These things are really tough, and they're really durable, and they'll dig holes in the ground <laughs> and do all kinds of things. Um, but uh, that prop that came on the Mustang, that four-bladed thing, you know, obviously made in China, but, uh, but the thing breaks really easy. And just the type of material it is, is just not as durable. So at the moment, I've got a two-bladed prop on it. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that what I've done is a, a lesser sort of, you know, uh, uh, demand on the motor so where it's safe. Um, but it's probably not developing as much thrust as what I'd be getting with a four-bladed prop. Um, so th there can be situations where you will want to look into using a different prop than what, the, uh, what came on the actual plane, but don't just go willy-nilly about it and just stick anything that you want on there. It really needs to be carefully thought through to make sure it's going to be safe. As going with too big of a prop could create a problem. Okay, so uh, in the works, um, uh, how to choose component, uh, compatible components for uh, when you're coming up, say, repowering a, a nitro plane or something like that. Uh, how to check the electric motor for deterioration. Be talking about checking its uh, speed and power and thrust uh, uh, things to where you know that uh, it's all good and perhaps even compare one motor with another one, that type of thing. Um, and um, uh, yeah, be all the stuff that comes up along the way. So, uh, thank you for uh, your patience and <laughs> watching through all of this today. Uh, again, subscribe to our channel and you can keep uh, up to date with all of these things that I'm uh, generating along the way. And in the meantime, get out to your club and enjoy some flying. <laughs> Have a great day.